Me now, because I'm sick of the clicking. Yeah, All right, I'm running. So you said you got three degrees and what? Can you say that no, again? I'm saying I have, I have, I've done everything this country says you're supposed to do. I've, I've, I have all the degrees you're supposed to have. I have three degrees, a master's degree from an Ivy League institution. I have a PhD from one of the top public universities in the country. I have, uh, I'm a, a war vet. I've served in the military. And we're one or two checks away from, from losing everything. That's Dr. Jared Ball, professor at Morgan State University. I had the unique opportunity to win a grant from Lilly and go interview him in Washington, D.C. because he's written two great books. He's run for president before, and he's just a very smart person that I wanted to get some information from. And quickly, you could see that he wasn't shy about talking about his financial situation, about how America has told all of us that if we want to see an increase in our financial situation, then we need to become educated. So he became educated. He has multiple degrees, one from an Ivy League school. He has a PhD. He's actually a professor. And he said he's one or two checks away from being extremely poor. And this is because of this capitalistic system that refuses to give people the capital they need to survive and thrive. I've uh, uh, run for president, I vote in everything, for everything. Um, uh, so, so I'm certainly not rich, I'm certainly not independently wealthy. Uh, you know, uh, and even now, not only that, I can even add to that. Now I'm a full tenured professor. I have uh, uh, advanced in my field as far as you can possibly go. Uh, well, Dr. Ball, I'm one of my students. You just didn't save good enough. You, you, something's going wrong, Dr. Ball. So, so get the bag. Well, so this is part of the thing. I mean, this is this is part of the mythology that that one keeps. Part of the mythology is to keep people from looking for alternatives and potentially rebelling. Uh, so the more you have hope in the system to to become so-called successful, the less likely you are to challenge it. So a lot of, uh, and, and this has been intentionally uh, developed by the business and political elite over the last 150 years. This is not a coincidence that we all uh, have this outlook. Uh, uh, but uh, so, so the, the mythology is of course, if you save and if you invest, you will become wealthy, but that's not how wealth is created. Again, in fact, most studies are pretty honest in telling you that the, for most part, the number one determinant of wealth is inheritance. Uh, and then as some of the more recent studies from uh, Dr. Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton. Derek Hamilton and others have shown that race is still the number one determinant is, uh, uh, for wealth. So, so uh, being black, being brown, being some called so-called other has a negative impact on your income potential, your earning potential, your your uh, uh, potential access you have. I mean, you know, other studies have shown that most you know the most high-paying jobs aren't even advertised publicly; they're passed down. Um, you know, so even when you're looking in the point, you know, the job wanted pages, whatever, you're looking online for a job. Most of the jobs that would pay all the money that people think that they're going to get aren't even listed there. Um, so the point is that it's rigged. And as I said earlier, you can't have rich without poor. So poverty and, and inequality have to be developed. Otherwise, there is no rich. So if you just even think of it that way and then start to look at the relationship. And I'll, I'll, I'll use this quick summary. I think six to eight of the world's or the country's, maybe the world's uh, wealthiest people are members of the Walton family. That is the mm. people that own Walmart. Uh, I believe, yeah, like 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 eight of the top 15 billionaires in the world, I think, come from that one family, something like that. So, but it's not just that they have the money from owning Walmart, which is a chain that is not only abusive to working people around the world, but it's something that can't just be duplicated by anyone else. Like you and I just can't go start another Walmart. I mean, that's not the, the fact. The reason Walmart exists as a dominant entity as Walmart is because it gobbles up everything else. So you can't have more than one. But it's not just that they have all that money. It's that they take that money and they use it through the Walton Family Foundation and other foundations 
they develop conservative public policy that is then through lobbying and other forms of, of influence imposed on people that are that are so-called elected by us to represent us in Congress to create policy that benefits their business interests. So whether it's agree, trade agreements, agreements, agreements with China or whether it's just engaging in more war so defense contractors can make more money every time a bullet is fired or a bomb is dropped, the, the, it's policy that is driving this inequality and the wealth for these handful of people, this handful of people. So this idea, again, that it's laziness or we can all do it is nonsense. Or this idea that it's not government policy and that it's all the private hard work of these individuals that develops this is all nonsense. One of the biggest issues that we have is our inability to see reality in a way that will help us to solve the numerous problems that we have. And this issue is made worse by the entertainment based media spewing pop propaganda about the problems that do exist. Uh, uh, examples of the, a lot of these self-help books are not grounded in sound economics. Uh, especially from people like Robert Kiyosaki and his Rich Dad Poor Dad book, and and he the, now the book does have some good things in it, but as far as uh, politics and economics and how that affects business and individuals and the overall uh, macro economy, it, it lacks all the fundamentals of economics in, in regards to those things. And the sad thing is that this book is now in my school. So a lot of kids are absorbing the information in this book and they're looking at their world and thinking that it, the way to financial freedom is through saving your money, investing, uh, improving their financial literacy. Therefore, they also think that those people that are poor have not done these things, that people who are poor are lazy, are financially illiterate, and that being an employer is bad, and that everybody needs to be a business owner. But, but if everyone is a business owner, then who's gonna work for them? Everyone cannot be a business owner, all right? There's nothing wrong with being a business owner, and there's nothing wrong with being an employee. They hold a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with one another, same as customers and business owners without customers you can't have business owners who's going to buy their products uh, but robert does not do a good job of fusing sound economic principles into his book he doesn't help the general public understand macroeconomics instead he takes a micro personal finance perspective and applies that to the macroeconomic problems such as unemployment, lack of wealth, income disparities, wage stagnation. He combines all of that as if these are actually microeconomic problems when, when homelessness, and unemployment, joblessness, wage stagnation are actually macro, big economic problems. My father was the head of education. PhD, all that stuff. I go home and ask him, said, why don't we learn about money in school? And he looked at me and says, because the government doesn't let us teach that subject. You're listening to Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he just talked about money. And he said his dad was a PhD person, ran some schools, asking him why don't they learn about money in school? His father told him because the government doesn't allow them to teach that. Uh, that's right. I, I'm a teacher. We do not teach anything about money. But unfortunately, Robert doesn't teach anything about money either. And I'm Rodney Smith, and this is a criticism that I'm providing on Robert Kiyosaki and uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad concepts and ideas that Robert has about um the economy, economics, poverty, poor people. This is my criticism of his thoughts on those ideas. Now, money, he does he spends all this time talking about money. He does not define money. He doesn't define correctly who creates the money. Now, he says banks create money. And he's referring to commercial banks. They do not create money. 
Uh, so what is money? Let's go over that. Money is a, a social unit of account. What does that mean? That means that money is a uh, thing that we use to uh, measure value. We use money to uh, measure the value of goods and services. Uh, we also use money to record debits and credits, and we use money to make calculations, all because money is a unit of value. Uh, so it's like a unit of measurement, in, like an inch. All right. It, it, it's something that we use against something else. In this case, money is used to value things. We also use money to record debits and credits because remember, uh, governments issue currency. All right. And in America, they have allowed the central bank to create money. Right. Central banks are not like commercial banks. Central banks create money and allow banks, commercial banks, to then lend out money, which means banks create debt uh, and central banks create money. Central banks are also in charge of the monetary policy. They control interest rates. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but during this recession, the central banks was the one who engaged in quantitative easing, which is basically like when they say people print money. Of course, we're not printing paper money, but quantitative easing is when they buy up assets um, so that they could try to um, uh, 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 encourage economic activity, they like lower interest rates, making it cheaper to borrow. Uh, but again, uh, when this happens, that's only going to benefit those with uh, money, capital and credit anyway, because the banks are only lending with people with good credit and collateral. Well, I wasn't poor by most people's standards, but I came from a family with a poor attitude, if you know what I mean, because rich, poor, middle class poverty starts with a fundamental attitude. Poverty is passed on. It's taught in your families and middle class is taught in families. And so the people right now who are sitting at home <clears throat> who are struggling financially or worried about money or unhappy, they may be making a lot of money, but unhappy with what they're doing, it was probably taught to you. you know? Now, listen to Robert, listen to him talk about how poverty and being poor is a mindset. Not that you're in a system that doesn't give you the resources needed to climb the financial and economic ladder. No, it's the way that you think. It's your lack of knowledge and that if you have this knowledge that somehow that's going to turn into capital and wealth. It's just disrespectful and wrong. Robert's whole point is to sell the idea of entrepreneurism over being an employee. You know, your super ego was taught Get a job, work hard, or you'll, or you'll never be rich, or the rich are evil, or whatever. The school system will never teach you about money. The school system was designed to teach you to be an employee. Now, last time I checked, the United States government is the largest employer in America. Last time I checked, a lot of people were able to reach middle class status because of a government job. Uh, last time I checked, the government employs more people than Walmart and Amazon. And last time I checked, the government has more money than Amazon and Walmart because the government can create the money. So it's ridiculous to keep making these arguments about entrepreneurism. Now, entrepreneurialism is good. People should be entrepreneurs, but they're not better than the employee. Neither one is better. It's a symbiotic relationship because the business owner needs employees, right? And that, that, that's one issue that I have with Robert is that he doesn't discuss this. He doesn't discuss the fact that banks create debt and banks basically lend to people who do not need it, really. The people who actually uh, need capital cannot get access to it. And he doesn't talk about the policies that keep this in place. And, and these are huge issues. He doesn't talk about capitalism and how you need capital to properly function in a capitalistic country. See, capitalism just means that there's going to be private ownership of the means of production. So instead of the government owning McDonald's, we have private individuals owning McDonald's. Instead of the government owning Walmart, we have private individuals owning Walmart. 
That's what capitalism is. Private ownership of the means of production. And uh, the the key word in capitalism is capital, right? You need capital uh, to be able to properly function as a business. Uh, so I define capital as anything that you own that could bring you money, right? So uh, for a Let's say a car dealership, their capital would be their salespeople and, of course, the land and the cars because the car dealership needs the land uh, to place the cars on so people could come see the cars. They need salesmen to come sell the cars at a price that's beneficial for the dealership. And once all of that happens and someone buys a car, that's money for the uh, dealership. And, of course, they got the service department, too. Uh, that has to sit on the land so the customers could bring their cars in on the land and customers pay to have their cars fixed and serviced. OK, so that's why the, the employees would be capital. The land would be capital. The equipment that they use in the service department to fix and service cars would be capital. All of that helps to bring in money to the dealership. That's why I say that's why I define it as things that you own that will bring you capital. Um and of course, there's more advanced definitions, but I like using definitions that people can understand and you can easily use. Um, but Robert doesn't address capital. He doesn't address access to capital or access to capital markets that poor people don't have access to venture capital and other different capital markets uh, that, that poor people are not allowed to get um, hard money loans so they can invest in real estate properties that's in their neighborhoods he doesn't talk about large financial companies that are buying up these foreclosed homes um he, he doesn't talk about any of this he, he he simply is talking on an individualistic level um so that he can sell books because it sounds good and in america the individual hard worker is valued so you have to develop an ideology that's around that the individual doing something where he's working hard and using his individual intelligence to get ahead in life you see robert and many other people they need to sell books i'm not doing this to sell any books i'm not doing this for likes i'm doing this in hopes that people uh, start looking at the economy in a different way so we can organize as a people have productive conversations when we organize and create policies that are going to free people from this debt uh, cycle from from depression because you don't have the bag or you don't have money uh, because in this country since money is the uh, central organizing uh, thing uh, money is is central to this community many, many people base their whole existence on how much money and material wealth that they have because we live in a very materialistic individualistic country so individually if you don't have a lot of money or wealth you're looked down upon and that's where the depression comes in because then you'll look down upon yourself because you don't have a lot of money and material wealth and people like robert and many other people like robert will be telling you that it's because of your thinking you are thinking you have a poverty mindset that's why your bank account looks the way that it does here here buy my book and here's a, some solutions that you can implement and you will have money then. Really? Come on. Don't fall for the okie though. Uh, this type of thinking has infiltrated so many areas of our lives that we need to be free from this. It's just not true. That's why, and for my biblical folks, look into the biblical jubilee. Look into the work by economist uh, Michael Hudson uh, and free them from our debts, I think is the name of the book by Michael Hudson. He talks about in ancient times, uh, people would uh, be freed from their debts because that's what actually helps us become more productive. You don't need people in jail because they cannot pay debts. Uh, during these jubilee years, people would be uh, have their land returned to them. They'd be free from debt prison. That, that's what is needed now. We need student loans forgiven. We need all these de debts written off. So we can get back to being more productive. We need to redefine what we call work. It, it, it's a lot that needs to be done. And it needs to be done too for our own psychological health, our own mental health, our own mental and physical well-being. 
uh, a lot of work that we do is not considered work because it doesn't have a monetary value attached to it. If you notice, things are considered work when you get paid for it. But look at how many mothers and fathers do tons of work and grandmothers and aunts and uncles do work in and outside the home that's not considered work because they're not getting paid. I know a lot of what I'm talking about may sound weird and crazy, but this is how we need to start thinking. And it should sound weird and crazy. We can't keep thinking and talking about the exact same things, but expect different outcomes. That is insanity and crazy. So, yes, I need to sound crazy. I need to be talking about things that don't exist now so we can get to where we say we want to go. Because clearly talking about the same things and doing the same things is not producing the result we say that we want which means we don't want the results we've been getting now. So what we do want is something that does not exist, which means we need to talk about things that do not exist now, which sounds crazy, but a lot of things are sound counterintuitive, but they actually help, right? Like nobody wants to work out because it hurts, but in that pain, you grow stronger. So that's what we have to do. Uh, so you're not poor because you're thinking wrong. You're poor because you lack capital and wealth. And there's uh, systems in place to ensure that the poor do not receive that capital and wealth. And there were policies that did ensure that those people did get capital and wealth. Just look at the start of the United States. Uh, people with voting rights were white males that owned land. So if you were a white male or a white woman that did not own land, you did not have voting rights. Why do you want voting rights? So that you could put policies in place that will help you and your group. Well, if your group don't have voting rights, then how can you put things in place that will make sure that your group has what it needs? You can't, huh? That's what voting is, is all about. That's what organizing is all about. And I'm not making a comment to suggest that our current voting system will help us, but uh, electoral politics is not the only type of politics that we can engage in. Uh, I'm done rambling. This is Rodney Smith with the Black Family Institute. Hopefully you learn some things about uh, capitalism. Hopefully you learn some things about capitalism, that it involves capital, that it is the private ownership of uh, the means of production, uh, that you need capital to engage in capitalism, or will you stay poor if you don't have capital? Uh, hopefully you learn the difference between macroeconomics, which is the overall larger economy, uh, and microeconomics, which deals with uh, individuals and individual businesses. Um, hopefully, you learn that there are some differences between finance, macroeconomics, and um, microeconomics. And hopefully, you learn the difference between central banks and commercial banks. Central banks create the money and create the monetary policies that the commercial banks must use when they give out loans. Central banks are also in charge of quantitative easing or QE and interest rates. Commercial banks are not. Commercial banks are giving out loans usually based on whoever has collateral. All right, So they're just creating debt. Commercial banks are creating debt. Central banks are creating money. Money all right, is a unit of account. We use this unit to make credits and debits for the country, and we use money as a valuation uh, uh, system, all right? It helps us to uh, value things in our society, all right? This is Rodney Smith with the Black Family Institute. Hopefully, you learned something today.